We light our chalice flame today as chalice flames are lit in our brother and sister congregations across the world. And as we do so, we will hear words from those gathered by the International Council of Unitarians and Universalists for use this month, January 2021. These are words provided by the Hungarian Unitarian community. We light this chalice in remembrance of those who laid down the foundation of our communities in the spirit of freedom, love, and tolerance, to remember that true light will outshine darkness. Continuing with words from Francis David, the 16th century founder of the Hungarian Unitarian Church. Faith is the gift of God. The true signs of faith are an inner purity and love and an honest life and good deeds. Love is the ultimate interpretation and completion of the law. Love is a commandment. Love is the true freedom which does not bear the bondage of fear. Love is the creative spirit of the world, the highest treasure of humankind. Welcome, welcome to this meeting house today. We gather on the first Sunday since Christmas, with Twelfth Night arriving just last Tuesday. The kings finally made it to Bethlehem, and Christmas in this part of the world is over for another year. And the new year is already 10 days old. Now this year, of course, we are surrounded by change. Perhaps we'd looked to the new year for a swift washing away of 2020. A return to something a little more normal. Yet this week, with coronavirus increasing so sadly, and real uncertainty and fears in the United States and wider, the new change shows itself to be part of the old change too. Yet that is reality. We live in a real world. We live in a world where we look at how we, as individuals and as a community, might be able to bring love, no matter what is going on around us. How might we bring compassionate change and renewal to this world at the start of this new year, to ourselves, to one another, to whomsoever we might meet or never meet? Let us find space today in ourselves and in our communities for love and for friendship. Let us be the change that we seek at the start of this new year. As we reflect today, this time and this space are yours. I bid you a very warm welcome. Let us gather in song. Our first hymn today is a call to all those caught in the whirl of change and perhaps confusion. A call to step away, to listen deeply, to hear the voice in our deeper selves, the call for peace. With Emily Thorne's words, do you hear? The words will be on your screens. Let's go. 
Our first reading today is a piece by the Reverend Robbie Walsh, uh, the late Unitarian Universalist minister. Uh, Robbie died three, four years ago now. Uh, he was a lovely man. He came to England uh, for a sabbatical uh, a few years ago, and I met him then. He was based in Horsham. I think he came and preached here in Seven Oaks as well. This is a piece that uh, he wrote called, I'm Picking Up Litter. I'm doing good. I'm looking good. I'm cleaning up the world, doing God's work, setting a good example. I'm angry, angry at the people who toss this trash from their car windows. It lies in woods, in grass, among wild flowers, on the gravel beside the road. I feel violated. I call them names. I imagine delicious punishments. I forgive them. They are inherently worthy. They are my kin. I concentrate on their worthiness, that my forgiveness will not slip away. I'm a good person to forgive them. I'm setting a good example. There are worse things in the world than tossing trash along the road. There is oppression, injustice, war. Children die of pestilence, hunger, neglect. The oppression in this moment is abstract. The trash is present and real. I never drop trash from my car window. But I have done worse things. Things not so visible. Picking up this litter will not bring my life into balance. On the scale of evil, this trash is trivial. But I'm still angry about it. And I'm doing good. The words of Robbie Walsh. Let us come together in a time of prayer. Today is a gift. Each day you have another chance. Sometimes you do nothing. Sometimes you get lucky and the day shines on you. But how often do you seize that day with your hands and make it your own? Each day may we wake up and live this life with each other and try to build a dream. As we live this day, let us be aware of all those people across the face of the world, those in cities, those in deserts, those on mountains, who, as the sun rises, will be waking up too to the hope of this new day. If you wish to, please join with me in the words of the final prayer, following the words on the screen. May our feet rest firmly on the ground. May our heads touch the sky. May our seeing be clear. May we be able to listen to others May we be free to touch and explore. May our words be true. May our hearts and our minds be open. May our hands be ready to help others. 
May our gifts be clear to us. May we know we belong in the great circle of life. Amen. Our second reading is from the Unitarian anthology Heart and Soul. And this is a piece written by Dr. Mel Prido, who's Assistant Professor of Religious Studies at Leeds University and a member of the Unitarian Congregation in Wakefield. This is Green Revolution. Real change is slow and incremental. Apparent sudden change, like a political revolution, is always the result of a long process of development and activism. Real change happens person by person. The big issues like climate change can be reduced to thinking about our actions now. Individual choice about how to travel, how to heat our homes, what to buy and what will be is what tips the balance in favour of the globe. All the politicians can do is attempt to influence individual choice. Real change is about more than appearance. Why drive a low emission car if by doing so you justify driving more often? Why use recycled paper but not recycle your own waste paper? Real change can be painful but is rewarding. It's painful to change the driving habits of a lifetime, to forgo a foreign holiday, to pay more for green electricity. But the long-term rewards are a future for our planet and our children. Change is necessary. The words of Dr. Mel Prido. Our second hymn, following Robbie Walsh's meditative poetry and Mel Prido's call for real change. This is a hymn of personal promises. I would be true, for there are those who trust me. The words will be on your screens.
Well, we made it. A terrible 2020. A year that started with such promise and proved to be the worst in global terms that many, most, if not all of us, can truly remember. And now we're into the new year. 2021. It's here. It's a cyclical, fresh start. Yet, of course, it doesn't necessarily feel that way this time round. Normally, at this time of year, it's clean things away, a new, fresh beginning. But it would be wrong to start to claim that we're starting afresh in 2021, that all the uncertainties had been washed away. They haven't. Our news broadcasts are still filled with coronavirus. And this week, the unsettling and disturbing news from across the Atlantic, too. Yet, of course, in the midst of this, we're seeing also stories of greatness. Of those caring for others with love and compassion. Of those giving up their liberties for the safety of all. We're seeing a growing revulsion across the Atlantic at the chaos and the thuggery the world witnessed in Washington on Wednesday. There is good in the world. And we are part of that world. And this is a new year. That much cannot be taken away from us. It's a time for resolutions, not just revolutions. Now my problem is rarely that my New Year resolutions don't happen. It's rather that they're always being amended or replaced and I can't decide what it is that I should be doing. Is it the fabled tidy up of the vestry? Uh, for those that know about this, you'll be delighted to know that at least my desk has been sorted this new year. But my mind and my hopes bounce from tidying up to repairing things long broken, to putting my books in order perhaps, to going vegetarian, to signing up to good causes for actions and for donations, to campaigning against dictatorships, wherever they may be. To make the world a better place. Not just a tiny bit, but in every possible way that I can. And that's just not going to happen. Not through just one person, in any case. And yet we can all become like frozen rabbits in the headlights at this point. We sometimes just don't know where to start. And with everything else going on around us in the world right now, we can't even hear ourselves think at times. And hence, we don't start at all. Now in our first reading today, that wonderful piece by Robbie Walsh, <clears throat> Robbie gave us a meditation on picking up litter from the street. And I loved the way his thoughts tumbled out in much the same way I can imagine you would as you engage with such a mundane task. The mind wanders. The connections start to be made. Robbie starts, well, I'm doing good. I'm looking good. I'm cleaning up the world, doing God's work, setting a good example. It doesn't get better than that, does it? There's a sense of pride, not always a bad thing, a sense of pride in the good work that he's doing. However, while he's thinking this through, it turns to anger. Anger at those who threw the litter in the first place. I'm angry, he says. I feel violated. I call them names. I imagine delicious punishments. This is a Unitarian minister, imagining delicious punishments, surely not. And then he's off forgiving them. Litter droppers are, after all, far less of a threat to the world than those supporting injustice, oppression or war. And other things, things we all do, things we're ashamed of. They'll probably all be different, but we all have something in our hearts that we know we shouldn't do. And then, in a perfect circle, 
Robbie acknowledges that he is making a difference after all. He's picking up litter. He's still angry the litter is there, but he is helping clear it away. Now for me, there are several threads within that meditation that ring true. The first is how quickly the mind moves from feeling good, hey, I'm clearing up, to feeling angry. Anger at those that litter, but then anger at the greatest, greater injustices and evils across the world. And frustration, frustration that he can't manage to solve them all, all at once, all by himself. All these terrible things, and all he's doing is picking up litter. Now the thought behind this approach is echoed in a very well-known prayer. It's a piece called the Serenity Prayer. Now some may know it, and it begins with these four lines. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Courage to change the things I can. And wisdom to know the difference. They're wonderful words. Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Courage to change the things I can and wisdom to know the difference. It goes on to talk, helpfully, of the intent to live one day at a time, to enjoy one moment at a time. And it's been adopted by many organisations and groups, especially self-help groups. Alcoholics Anonymous is the notable group that uses this, but many others do too. It's that recognition that we are able to do something, but recognise what that is. The prayer, however, then moves on to an idea that we might accept a sinful world and put our faith in God, rather than seek to perfect it all ourselves. And that's a point in the prayer that I've always puzzled over. As a Unitarian, I stop at an indication that I should just hand over control to something I cannot be even really sure I know exists or I understand or I think can act. Why would I do that? Now the Serenity Prayer was said to be written by the American theologian Reinhold Niebuhr. Now there is some doubt and the academic wranglings continue but Reinhold Niebuhr certainly wrote some very similar words in 1937. And the slightly amended version known as the Serenity Prayer has generally been attributed to him. Now, as I say, it was written in 1937, a 20th century theologian, and Reinhold Niebuhr developed a theory, and it was a theory known as Christian realism. And living in those early part of the 20th century, He'd seen two world wars and the Great Depression and the violent and murderous racism of the Ku Klux Klan and many other things. And seeing all of this, Niebuhr, in his Christian realism theology, rebelled against the notion that humankind could make heaven here on earth. He argued instead that humankind was incapable of perfection, that evil will always exist, now, it's a theology grounded in the idea of original sin, that sin will always be there. It's not something I, can, I find easy to accept, and I still don't know that I do. But thinking through that lens nevertheless helps in many other ways to explain the difficulties we face in trying to make the world a better place. There is always someone else out there trying to make it worse. Depressing stuff, perhaps. But I think we can all see the truth within his words. Interestingly, Reinhold Niebuhr was Barack Obama's favourite theologian. I'm not sure the current president has a favourite theologian. However, whilst Niebuhr could have left it at that, 
and simply accepted that the world would never be perfect. He instead allowed this theology to guide him to some substantively liberal actions. He spoke out against the Ku Klux Klan and shocked fellow Protestants in Detroit by openly encouraging all Protestants to vote for a Catholic mayor. His reason being, the Protestant candidate was supported by the Klan. Many in Detroit credited Niebuhr with the result that did see the Catholic candidate win. Now Niebuhr's realism, for him a Christian realism, but his realism allowed him to accept there were individuals and ideas that would not perfect themselves. It was therefore up to everyone else to take the actions that negated the bad. He spoke out against hardline communists and fascists rather than seeking to change them. He spoke out against McCarthy rather than trying to find his good side. He spoke out against the US engagement in Vietnam and his ideas and support were, in, were given, or his ideas and support were sought and given by Martin Luther King Jr. and many others in the civil rights movements. Christian realism, accepting there is evil in the world and acknowledging that it's beyond our individual effort to remove it. Yet taking that realism to support individual action to make a difference. They're not going to change, so I'll just have to try and do it myself. But grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Courage to change the things I can. Now, our second reading from theology professor Mel Prido takes, I think, some of the possibilities of Niebuhr's approach to the world. In her piece on the Green Revolution, Mel raises the challenge to climate change and the attempts we all might make to try and ensure efforts and effects and damage are limited and minimised. Mel sees the whole piece, and very much a whole piece, she sees the whole piece as one that requires change within us. It involves, she says, people like us thinking through our actions and their consequences. It involves us taking seriously our responses, responsibilities to the planet and to each other. Now there is a commitment implied in these words. A commitment to a greener planet, of course, but also a personal commitment to review our personal responsibilities in the world. Recognising that we cannot, from a realistic perspective, necessarily rely on others to do the work for us, but asking us to consider rationally what it is we can do. We can't do it all, but we need to do something. So let's work to recognise what it is we are able to do, and then do it. So far, so serenity prayer, but Mel goes further. The Green Revolution, she says, the Green Revolution will ride on the wave of a spiritual revolution when people everywhere listen to each other and the earth and recognise that what unites us is much greater than the barriers we build between us. At first sight, I wondered if this was possible, if a realist approach was accepted. Whether it's reasonable to believe that the perfect were possible, that the world might come together as one if we accept there are always bad apples out there. Now the mayhem in Washington this week and the commentary that has followed has raised stories of division. 
yet also of coming back together once more. But taking it to a further point, the second part of Niebuhr's prayer encourages us to accept that the world is not perfect and to put our faith in God. Now, for me, this is a Unitarian twist that we need to bring, to bring this realistic approach to earth, to life. And it doesn't mean leaving God to sort it out. And for Unitarians, that very statement will be a confused and uncertain one anyway. For many of us, God is not something separate, if God is there at all. God is instead both part of everything and not. God's work is delivered by us, not by something separate. As Unitarians, our definition of God, or the divine, or the all that is, will be myriad and unique to every single one of us. So in asking each of us what we can, to do what we can, to reflect on our abilities, our opportunities, our conscience, in asking each of us to do what we can, we are in effect asking the world to take a step. Just as Niebuhr risked the wrath of the sharp Protestant Catholic divide in 1920s Detroit, he was looking and encouraging people to realize that evil was not common, was not in the common Christian faith they held, but was in the racist views, for example, of the Klan's favored candidate. By encouraging all to see where they might do good rather than evil, he was able to achieve a change that was otherwise out of his reach. Now he was a firm Christian, he placed his faith in God, but it was the God within and the God without. In the interconnecting thread that holds each of us and the rest of humanity together as one. Yes, there are bad apples in the barrel, but by identifying them, calling them out, things can get better. Our resolutions, never just for New Year, our resolutions, I'm constantly making them, need to be born from reflection. It may be reflective meditation on a repetitive task, like Robbie Walsh's litter picking, or it may be more formal meditation and prayer time. But it's the contact with the all that is, with the divine, with the God within and without, that will bring forward ideas. Do you hear that voice, as our first hymn said? And in the words of Reinhold Niebuhr, accept the things you cannot change, but seek the courage to change the things you can. There will always be evil in the world, I suggest. There will always be a dictator waiting in the wings. There will always be an illness of some form. However, if we can accept that, which is hard, but perhaps necessary, then we're free to make the changes in the world that are in our gift. And if everyone were to do that, as Mel Prido says, the new spiritual revolution will be unstoppable. Now this may be a little way off yet, but in the meantime, the difference each of us might make alone will contribute to a greater good, a far greater good than the evil that lurks. Focus on the good that you can do, inspiring others to stand up for good by doing that very thing yourself, keeping yourself safe, doing your best to keep others safe too, uniting the world in a march towards something better, getting real, making all the difference you can. Let us come together now in a time of stillness and quiet as we settle our bodies, perhaps closing our eyes, focusing on our breath 
I shall speak some words, and I shall strike the singing bowl. We'll come together in stillness and quiet together. That stillness will be broken by music as we continue our reflections. as we settle our bodies. Our words for reflection come from Carl Jung, the Swiss psychoanalyst and philosopher. He said, you are what you do, not what you say you'll do. You are what you do, not what you say you'll do.
Some closing words. In the name of us all, let there be peace and love among us. May the skies be clear. May the streets be safe. In the name of us all, let there be peace. Amen.